Thank you all for coming today. Yesterday was a very difficult day for the Winston-Salem, Forsyth County community. I was on the phone early in the afternoon with the State Highway Patrol, with the State Bureau of Investigation, and with the Department of Public Safety getting updates on what was happening here, the trauma that students and parents and others were facing. I called Sheriff Kembro and Chief Thompson and District Attorney O'Neill, Mayor Joins, and talked to legislators. And I wanted to come today to let the people of this community know that the state of North Carolina was behind them and that we wanted to provide all the kind of help that we could. And I want to thank all of these folks up here for uh, the work that they've done. Our hearts go out to the parents and the family of this young man who was shot and killed yesterday at Mount Tabor High School. I just talked with them back there in the back room. Our hearts go out to all of the students, staff, educators at Mount Tabor and other schools that were affected by this. People who had to endure the pain and the trauma and the fear that this kind of violent incident brings. Our hearts go out to parents who were waiting in a parking lot, hoping and praying, sweating, crying, hoping that their child would be reunified safely with the family. Our hearts go out to the brave law enforcement officers who made tough decisions, but also who bravely sought and apprehended a suspect with a gun whom they knew had killed somebody. And the steps that they took to protect all of the other students and staff. Our hearts go out to all parents, not only in this community, but across our state, who have children in school, who are experiencing the concern, the anger, the fear that this kind of incident brings. I'm here today because I know that there is pain. I'm also here today to commend educators and law enforcement and this community for all of the work that they have done to get through this. You are not alone. This is a pain and a fear that no child or parent should ever have to confront simply by having a child go to school. School is a place of learning and growth and we have to do everything we can to keep them free of threats and violence. Over the years, North Carolina has worked very hard to make sure that every single school in our state can respond to a violent incident. And I think you saw the coordinated response that was a result of all of that planning and work that had gone on years in advance. Every school has specific coordinated school violence response plans that, that have been formed between schools and law enforcement. They all have lockdown procedures to keep other students and staff and educators safe whenever there is a threat or whenever a violent incident occurs. Our Department of Public Safety has detailed floor plans of every single school so law enforcement can know exactly where things are. And there is technology that they can use to try to deal with this. I'm pleased and, and, and proud of the State Highway Patrol 
Captain Needham is here, who was with this team all day yesterday, and our State Bureau of Investigation, uh, Director Robert Schirmeyer is here with us today, who responded immediately and worked closely with law enforcement here. A lot of the plans that I just talked about were, were executed yesterday, and I commend everybody for doing that, having a place of reunification even when a suspect was on the loose and making sure that all other students were protected and that further loss of life was prevented. This is a painful time and it's a time for us to, to come together to comfort each other, but it's a time for us to collect our resolve and to do everything we can to redouble our efforts to keep our schools safe, training school resource officers, making sure that there are more mental health treatment and prevention for students, investing in educators and keeping guns out of school. We have a lot of work to do ahead. Our educators, now we have the superintendent here as well, they have a lot of challenges as it is and making sure our children learn, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. But I believe in the people of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, and I believe in the people of North Carolina. I believe that we can grieve and comfort this family and come together as a community with an even deeper resolve to make sure that we keep our schools safe. So Sheriff Kimbrough, I'm going to turn it over to you to see if anybody else wants to make uh, remarks, and then I will be glad to answer questions from the media. Sheriff? Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. Uh, you have no idea how much the formal call meant yesterday, getting a call from you. As I said yesterday, yesterday was a very sad day for me and a sad day for this community. There are a lot of heroes that were out there yesterday, all of our law enforcement partners, all of them, from the highway patrol to probation parole to, of course, my partner, Winston Salem Police Department, the FBI, the marshals, everything with a badge showed up yesterday. I'm grateful for that. I'd be remiss if I didn't give thanks to God for the mercy that he showed yesterday as well. But what I want my community to know is this. While yesterday was a difficult day for us, we've seen some difficult days. And as always, God has delivered us through the valleys and over the mountains. And he will deliver us again from this. I applaud the teachers at Mount Tabor, how they sheltered in place with those kids. I saw the trauma on the kids' face. I cried with the mother, Miss Shannon. And what I want you to know is this, is that we will get through this and we won't let fear stop us from moving forward together. We won't. As the governor has said, the resources that we're applying from the federal government, to the state, to local, we will get through this. I want to thank my brother McFadden who showed up from Mecklenburg in the wee hours of the morning to stand with me, to answer my phone while I try to get a few hours of sleep. But I've got to give you the message that, as the governor said, we were back there talking with Shannon, uh, who lost her son yesterday. She told me again, and I'm going to be obedient to what she told me again. Yesterday, she told me to say his name, and I said his name. Today, she said, Kimbrough, tell the mothers to love on their babies. Because I didn't get a chance to tell my baby I loved him. She said, and tell the mothers to tell their babies to put their guns down. Because it's senseless. I know that she's hurting. She said she hadn't stopped crying. She hadn't been asleep but an hour. 
What I'm asking this community to do is this. We're going to band together. We're going to move forward as a community. As the governor said, we're going to double down on our resources. I'm going to ensure the community and our schools that our kids are safe. We're going to restore this. That's my promise to this community. I'll step back and I'll let my, my partner, um, Chief Thompson, uh, because we're in this together. We're one community and we won't be divided. Good morning. I am Katrina Thompson, Chief of Police for the Winston-Salem Police Department. I want to start out by thanking Gov Governor Roy Cooper for his support. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, he called both of us yesterday relatively quickly to show support for our, our agency and our community. I also want to thank our law enforcement partners from all over the state. North Carolina State Highway Patrol, Captain Needham and his team has been with us from the beginning of this incident. I got a call from, from Colonel Johnson yesterday who was showing all the support and told us whatever we needed, they were here to support us. Director Schumacher from the state, uh, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation who also called and um, pledged all the support that we needed. We had our federal partners, the FBI, the ATF. We had um, the DEA, we had them all here. We had our state, um, uh, all of our state law enforcement. And then we had our neighboring cities, Greensboro, High Point. We had Davidson County, we had Thomasville. We had the love and support of our law enforcement family across our state. And then we had our first responders, our medical, emergency medical who responded and, and gave life saving measures to our student. To the amazing, the amazing staff, faculty at Mount Tabor who was willing to give their lives to save their children's lives. I want to also thank our mayor, Alan Joins, for his support, continued support with us, and also to our state legislators. I got a call yesterday from Senator Lowe. And finally, I have got to say a special thanks to the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department and the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office who laid it all out there and they are still out there. And then finally, I want to ask that you give me a moment to speak directly to our children, our students. What you experienced yesterday at Mount Tabor no one should ever experience at all, ever, in their lives. I can only imagine how traumatic that experience could have been. And I want you to know that it is okay not to be okay today. I want you to know that we will provide all the services that you need we will have therapists available for you. And I think you all heard our superintendent, Trisha McManus, speak to that very thing yesterday. We are here to help support you as you get through this. Some of the most memorable times in my life were spent in school. I cannot imagine having the experience of what many of you went through yesterday as a lasting memory of a lifetime. Parents, pay attention to your children. You know them better than anybody else. If they are struggling, help them. If you don't know how to help them, call me. Call Sheriff Kimball. 
called the school board, school system rather. We will help you help our kids. And finally, parents, take a little bit of extra time to hug your child a little bit tighter, to look them in the eyes and tell them that you love them, and realize that there is a mother today who don't have that opportunity. Thank you. Glad to have Senator Paul Lowe and Representative Amber Baker, District Attorney uh, Jim O'Neill, who's also here. I don't know, Mr. DA, do you want to give any kind of update at, on, on the situation? Uh, Jim O'Neill, I'm the District Attorney here in Forsyth County, and let me begin first by saying that, Governor Cooper, we uh, sincerely appreciate you coming being with us today you know this is a difficult time for our community and you know your commitment was with us from the beginning so uh, we very much appreciate you being here with us you know we saw uh, a lot of heroes yesterday uh, with our law enforcement community they arrive out on the scene and they know that there's a shooter running around and they don't stop they run right into the unknown, because they, they're here to keep us safe and protect us. And my brothers and sisters out there in, in law enforcement, thank you. The whole community thanks you for what you did yesterday, trying to keep us safe. As the, as the father of children in public school, uh, this was a traumatic phone call, of course, that I received yesterday, knowing what was going on in our public schools. Because we all, when we send our kids off to school in the morning, this is the last thing in our minds. And so it shakes you to your core when something like this happens. The prosecutor's office here in town, we have long taken a zero tolerance policy as it relates to violence in schools. And without commenting on the facts in this particular case, of course, moving forward, we will continue to take a zero tolerance policy as it relates to violence in our schools. We are here to keep the community safe with our law enforcement partners. And again, without, without commenting on the facts of this case, we have awesome resources standing behind me and standing out here today in the audience that will support us, our county commissioners that are present, our city council members that are present and willing to provide the resources we need. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you what, we need more opportunities for kids after school. We need more boys and girls clubs. We need more people to volunteer their time so that children have options after school is over. A lot of, lot of two parent working homes out here and there's no one back there watching the child in sixth and seventh grade when Gangs can very easily persuade a child in sixth and seventh grade to come follow their lead. And if a child enters a gang in sixth or seventh grade, we've lost them, folks. We've lost them. So we, we need things for our children to do after school that are positive and productive. Idle hands are going to be the devil's workshop from now till the end of time. Thank you again to the heroes that ran in there yesterday, not knowing what to expect. God bless our law enforcement. God bless the teachers and the faculty at Mount Tabor that acted selflessly yesterday 
to be sure that there wasn't further tragedy. Thank you. So I'll be glad to take some questions and up here people would ask answer specific questions about this case, although I know they will be limited in what they can say. Governor yes. Cooper, Governor Cooper, Cassie Sherman with ABC 45 News. You were talking about how important it is for schools to have plans, but how important is it to practice those plans in the schools for kids? Well, we know that, and they can talk about it specifically here, we know that law enforcement and school systems and principals already are working with their plans and making sure they have them in place. And some schools do do have drills that they do for this kind of thing. It's unfortunate that we have to do it, but to be prepared in the event this incident occurs is critical because if you've got a threat, you've got to make sure that you keep students and educators safe. Uh, we've been working on this a long time and so I think it works pretty well. I think we all have agreed and we met about an hour earlier this morning. We've got to make more investments in our school with mental health professionals and psychologists and counselors and, and making sure that our children have these wraparound services because we've got to work harder on prevention. It's critical to be able to respond when this happens. And I think yesterday that was done well. And I think schools across this state are prepared in the event that that happens. Governor Cooper, um, you obviously have hit on this, but this is the second uh, school shooting we've seen in a week in our state. Um, as governor, how can you personally make schools safer and what might those steps exactly look like? Will there be more legislation? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we have to guarantee that our schools are safe for our parents, for our educators, and for our children. We have spent a lot of time working on these school violence plans to make sure we are ready to react in a moment's notice to keep students, educators safe and to make sure that parents have a place for, for them to meet. But I think this goes well beyond that. I think the, the sheriff and the chief and the DA and I know that these legislators here, uh, we do need to make more investments in our children in early childhood education we need to make sure that uh, they have wraparound mental health services. We've got to make sure that they are engaged in our communities, making sure that they have positive things to do. And we've got a lot of things that we haven't done yet that we can do. And when you look at this budget negotiation that we have right now, uh, full funding of a sound basic education for our children can help provide some of these services that I believe can help us not only reduce violence in our schools, but violence in our communities. Governor Skip Foreman with the Associated Press, this may be directed to the district attorney, but there was a reference to the possible involvement of gangs. Do we know at this point, or can we say at this point, that there may have been a gang influence connected with this shooting? Mr. District Attorney. Again, let me, uh, let me reiterate that we cannot comment on the facts of this case, and I hope everybody understands that uh, when I'm speaking uh, about that, those sort of issues, that's a broader uh, social issue that, that we deal with uh, in, a, in a metropolitan area like this. And I, I would tell you that I've, in, in speaking with everybody standing behind me earlier today, uh, not to frustrate you all, but they certainly understand that we cannot talk about the facts of this case uh, while the investigation is still pending, the court case is, is still coming. We understand you have lots of questions, we really do, and a lot of the questions you have are gonna deal with fact. what are the facts in this case. We cannot share that with the public at this time, and we, we hope that you appreciate and understand that. Uh, we have to preserve the integrity of the investigation and the integrity of the prosecution. Yes, sir. If I follow up, yes, sir. where are you in the investigation? We know it's been less than 24 hours, but at what stage are you in determining the facts in this case? Well, I, I can tell you again that that's an ongoing investigation. I can't tell you where we are in terms of uh, whether or not we're completed or not. I can just tell you that the folks behind me are, are continuing to do the work. There's people on the ground right now continuing to do some more follow-up. Yes, sir. Um, 
we know that the suspect has been in custody. Can you say whether or not any criminal charges have been filed? Uh, yes, the question is uh, whether or not we can say any criminal charges have been filed. Uh, I can tell you, Michael, that where we are is that um, the, the case is being is still in the investigative stage, um, and we are going to proceed uh, along the court. Uh, we're going to proceed with the court case uh, the way the statute allows us to. However, I'm not trying to be coy with you. I think you understand that I, I cannot talk about what stage we're at uh, in, in terms of the, of the criminal prosecution. So would it be fair to say that no criminal charges or juvenile petitions have been filed? I, I, again, I can't answer those particular questions, and I'm not trying to be difficult. I know you have a job to do, uh, but there, that's information that we cannot release at this time. And um, not to frustrate everybody, but everybody standing behind me is aware of, of the importance of just allowing the process to play out. Can you speak to this? There was a video um, circulating online of what appears to be the arrest of the suspect. It happened at Thornaby Circle, which is kind of near Kernersville, so a little outside of the city. Can you confirm that video, the person in handcuffs, is the suspect? And if so, how did you find him there and what led you guys to that address? Again, I understand your question and I understand why you're asking these questions, but uh, with all due respect, we cannot answer those questions right now. We have to protect the integrity of the investigation and, as well as the prosecution. So uh, we, we're not able to answer specific questions right now. The statement was made that the student was believed to be a student at Mount Tabor, the, the suspect. Can you guys confirm whether he was in fact a student there and is he a juvenile? Uh, again, I'm, I'm not gonna answer those questions if. Uh, my role is different from everybody else up here, and, and my, my role is to protect the, the investigation and the prosecution. So I'm not trying to frustrate you all. I know that these questions are going to be specific fact-related questions, which uh, I hope that you will respect and understand that we cannot answer. Governor Cooper, could you talk about metal detectors in schools? Do you feel like it's important that all high schools in North Carolina have functional and operational metal detectors? Well, first, we need to make sure that we keep guns off of school grounds and we need to take steps to make sure that that happens. Uh, you know, that, that is a, a pretty dramatic step to, to put metal detectors in schools, but I think you cannot take it off the table. There may be particular schools and particular instances where you may want to do that. So I think that you have to be ready to use any tool that you have to make sure that that schools are safe. With this happening, yep. I mean, when it comes to this particular school and the Forsyth County School District as a whole, is there a clear backpack or mesh, mesh backpack policy that we we're able to see if a student is bringing a gun? Madam Superintendent, do you want to take that? There is not currently a backpack policy, so no, not a clear, but that is that's a strategy, potential strategy as well. I spoke with parents, I know we all did yesterday, who said that they were in communication with their students, but they also were in communication with their teachers, and the teachers were reassuring them that they were going to keep their children safe. For you, I mean, just take us into the mindset of what teachers went through yesterday and how they're holding up today. Yeah, so today we, that we had Mount Tabor, we kept Mount Tabor closed so that people could recover, people could, they are dealing with trauma, as has been stated. So, but our teachers responded beautifully. Yes, they have practiced lockdown drills. They were ready for this type of incident. Not that we ever want to have to actually follow through with it. Um, but yeah, so there, there are teachers are, you know, these are their students. Um, our children's lives are entrusted to us while they're with us for the six hours in, in the school day. So yeah, they're, they're dealing with trauma and that's why we're giving a day for folks to be able to, to, to cope and to be able to return um, in a different place. Superintendent, while you're up there, or anybody maybe with the school, can you talk a little bit about the, the victim, the student, who he was, uh, how he was as a person, just any positives there that you guys would like to share about him? So, um, so I, I know a lot about his background. I have not put, spoken to his parents uh, I, at the hospital, yes, but not about what I could share. But all, all I know is he was a great, a great kid. 
and very much loved by his parents and, and teachers that interacted with him. Superintendent, what's next for uh, the school district or Mount Tabor as a whole? What's the plan moving forward? Um, so, so right now, I mean, we are just focused on dealing with the tragedy of yesterday. And so basically, um, our students are picking up their, their cars today that were left in parking lots. Uh, tomorrow, they'll be picking up other, other supplies. And, and we'll just continue to provide the support, the emotional, the mental support that we're providing today. Um, we have a location off campus that students can come to that they're taking advantage of that um, today, students and staff. And we'll continue to, pr to provide that support. And then to follow up, what if you run into the issue of parents or students not wanting to come back to uh, Mount Tabor? Do you have a plan in place? So I think we'll handle those case, case by case. Um, Mount Tabor is a great school. The staff there is amazing. It is one of our schools that they really do uh, believe in the Mount Tabor way and they're extremely unified. Um, so I, I think we'll be handling cases like that case by case. Superintendent, everything seemed to have go gone well as far as the law enforcement reaction and everything like that, but is there anything that you guys learned from yesterday that you want to improve on or work on? Hopefully nothing like this ever happens again, but any resources you need from the state, anything like that? So we'll be debriefing with our partners. I will say, it, it, as everyone has said up here, the response was absolutely amazing to know that our law enforcement was on campus so quickly and they were in with our students. I knew our students were safe and I cannot say enough to, to thank um, uh, Chair, Sheriff Kimbrough and Chief Thompson for it, what happened yesterday to protect our students. Um, I think that you've heard a lot today. We've heard a lot about prevention and then how do we deal with a case if a case like this were to arise. And so um, we will continue focusing on a lot of the prevention, a lot of the things we brought forward um, in relation to even our ESSER dollars, um, to have more mental health support in our schools, um, to have after school, more after school programs. We're talking with so many partners right now about how to expand those, how to connect kids with resources that they need. Um, I, I believe that if kids feel capable, connected, and cared for, there's a different outcome with how they then proceed when it comes to, uh, to trauma and, and to how they react to situations. So I think we're gonna continue working on the prevention side while we also work with law enforcement debrief the situation and, and figure out what we can do better in the future. What can you tell parents, uh, in looking at the days to come here, next few days especially, about any uh, extra measures, if any, that are going to be in place to make mm -hmm. sure their kids are safe? Yeah. Well, our, our uh, law enforcement has provided, the Sheriff's Office today provided more uh, hands on deck within our schools, more coverage, um, so that students could see that presence and know and, and feel that sense of security, and that will happen for the, for the next few days. We will continue to provide what we provide, which is that ongoing emotional support um, for students, for staff, um, through our counselors and through other resources we have at our at our fingertips. I know as a longtime educator, you've been through these preparation scenarios, but is there anything that prepared you for the emotion of this kind of day? Um, so, no, I mean, you're right, Deal, have dealt over 30 years, 32 years with many different school crisis type of situations um, with many uh, lockdown, community lockdowns, lockdowns, uh, hurricanes, um, just many things that have caused, uh, have caused trauma um, for folks. Um, but, you know, you don't, you don't really prepare for this to actually happen. I think the best thing is how we respond and how we keep the family first. And, and keep them in our thoughts and prayers, and then focus on the rest of our students and the staffs within Mount Tabor and with all of the schools. And I have a question for the sheriff and or the chief. I'm um, wondering if you all can add anything as far as a possible motivation. Was there the intent here by the suspect to injure any others as far as you know? And or could you speak to the relationship between the suspect and the As the district attorney has said, I, I have no idea what the relationship was between the uh, two young men, uh, no ideal as relates to the motive. As the district attorney has said, you know, it's still an active investigation. We're still a lot of moving parts that uh, we are putting together. As he said, you know, the men and women of this county and this city and of this state are just still constantly out there uh, debriefing, uh, putting these parts together. So. Uh, there are a lot of questions that uh, we're still searching for answers. Can you tell us if you have recovered a weapon and also walk us through the securing of the campus? You guys were on scene quick and had everything secured in a matter of minutes. Well, as it relates to a weapon, again, that's a part of the investigation. I can't discuss 
any particular parts about the case, but as it relates to the securing of the campus. Um, as she said, and as uh, the district attorney said, everybody said there were resources that were there plentiful. Uh, we had two SROs already on the campus when the call came out. And so uh, myself, I arrived there eight minutes after the call came out. Uh, so um, resources were there. Uh, that's not even a question. Uh, we secured the, uh, the, the school, made sure that the children were safe, the students were safe, uh, the teachers, um, and we went on with the investigation. Can you tell us where the SROs were on campus at the time? Uh, I can't particularly tell you that. Again, that would be going into the investigation. I can tell you that they were assigned to the school as we have SROs assigned to most of the schools in this county. For the SROs, how, what would you say how they performed when it came to the situation? They were pretty quick to jump on the situation. Um, I can't say enough about uh, the men and women uh, that work in law enforcement, especially my guys. Uh, I hugged as many of them as I could yesterday because those two guys were remarkable. Uh, remarkable. Um, that's trauma that you don't prepare for. Uh, that's trauma that you don't see every day. Uh, so, in my opinion, they perform remarkable. And how important is it to have SROs in schools, especially when we do have gun issues among children, teens? You know, what, what I will tell you is that uh, the time in which we're living in, uh, SROs are a necessity in our schools. As a law enforcement professional with close to 40 years, uh, the times that we're living in are essential that you have uh, SROs in school. We have SRO, I mean, you have security in airports. Uh, the most valuable asset that we have in our society is our children. So why wouldn't you want security uh, in our schools? You know, a lot of people have alluded to a lot of things that are happening. Uh, you know, there's so many social issues in our society and in our community that become criminal justice issues. And they spill over in different places, in many places, i.e. You know, so, it's a necessary, in my opinion, it is a necessary. Sheriff, sure. can you or uh, maybe the superintendent just talk a little bit, was this suspect, were they on uh, the school's radar? Uh, is this a student you've had issues with or potentially the SROs? Again, uh, great question uh, uh, as relates to issues that's a part of the investigation, the type of students they were, what type of issues that they had in the school. Uh, it's something that uh, if I knew I wouldn't disclose, uh, and I don't think that uh, we could disclose that, that that's uh, a question that's a part of, yes, yes ma'am. Um, several of the parents that I spoke with wanted me to ask, they just don't quite understand how a gun or weapon of some kind can get into the school. Prior to this incident, what sort of security measures would prevent that from happening? And then to follow up, how might we improve that moving forward within the district? Here's what I would say to that. How The question is, how does guns get on a school, right? Um, I can tell you that guns are easily accessible in our society now. But I can tell you that in a school that is basically people and young men and women are coming and going, uh, book baths and so many other areas. Uh, you can't control that under the current rules and policies and laws that we have in place. Um, there's going to have to be some rethinking, some retooling, and some doubling down of resources. Uh, that's the answer I will give you to that question. When you say laws, do you mean within the district or broader than that? I say broader than that. I say throughout the state, throughout, you know, from what I have seen. Our schools are where our children go to learn. Thank you. And could someone speak to the security measures that are already in place at this particular high school, um, whether that's any surveillance cameras, how many SROs are there on an average day, if there are any metal detectors, anything like that? What I can tell you is as it relates to security measures at the school. I can't go into details to the exact security measures that we have in the schools, 
but I can assure you that we have security measures in the school. That I can assure you of. Yeah, we're getting the high sign back there, but I'll answer your question. Last, last question. Appreciate that. Um, obviously, this is not a usual uh, school year to begin with, and you're trying to reassure folks that yes, going back to into the past is, is is okay, and it's going to be safe. And I'm just wondering what two school shootings in the opening weeks does to that message. I, kind of, I would think it would deflect it in a way, but I want to hear your thoughts on this. We know that our children need to be in the classroom to get the full experience of learning. And that's why we've worked through this pandemic and why so many, more than 90% of our children are under a mandatory mask mandate and schools are taking the time to protect their children uh, from the pandemic. And also assuring parents that we do have safety measures in place all across our state in general, our public schools are very safe places for children. These, this kind of incident is, is something that doesn't usually happen and is horrible. It's one of the reasons why I'm here and it's one of the reasons why we've all gathered together as a community with resolve. But it's important for us to support our public schools, our educators, make sure that our parents know that we want them in the classroom and we want to do it safely. And now is the time for us to do that. Thank you guys for being with us.